thank you for joining us for another episode of the Developing Your Football World podcast. Here I ask some questions for the amazing coach, educator and founder of You Learnably, a license holder, PGCE and current PhD candidate, Gerard Jones. Gerard, thanks for coming on, joining us. Really looking forward to talking to you. How are you today? Decent. I'm, I'm just looking forward to the to the session i think it'll be uh it'll be good because the biggest advantage we've got is it it's probably more intimate isn't it so a great way just to talk coaching share ideas and that type of thing and, and hopefully people listening will get something out of it so yeah really looking forward to having a chat with you oh, i'm sure they will I'm, i'll try and get as much out of you as i can in this amount of time but i know that uh, you've got so much to offer so could you start with a brief overview of your coaching journey well, I started when I was probably about 14. I, I used to do uh, work experience. I used to do a bit of coaching, mini kickers, and then I end up coaching even when I was a youth team player at Halifax Town. So when you're 16, 17, 18, in the youth team in the under-19s at Halifax when uh, Chris Wilder was the manager at the time. And I'd, I'd help out, you know, with the, back then the centre of excellence. So this is Howard Wilkinson's, Charter for quality, so before the triple P, so you had academies and centers of excellence. So, with Halifax, I'd end up doing sessions with the 12s or the 15s and going into primary schools, doing stuff in Calderdale with um, you know the college program, or, or as I said, different schools, Selby District, you know, coaching two year olds, four year olds, five year olds, right through to being a university coach, working with the women's team at uh, Hull Uni when I was a student as well as doing uh, mini kickers with, the, with, I think it was girls, six, seven, eight-year-olds on a Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, mini kickers for the County FA. And then I uh, ended up setting up my own coaching business. I ran development centres and um, basically did uh, grassroots training, coaching grassroots teams, delivered one-to-ones, ran development centres, ended up being a director of coaching, director of football for Arsenal Soccer Schools, one of the largest soccer school programs in the world at the time and that allowed me to go to Italy and, and various different places and establish the largest development centre network in, in Hull and East Yorkshire and even when I ran independently and I ran uh, you know my own player and, and coach education uh, company we had development centres in Hull, York, Osset, Leeds, Bradford you know you name it um, which was great ended up going into academy football so I coached at Rochdale that was my first sort of real break, if you like, coach at an academy. Um, and it was at the start of the EBB really coming in, you know, when it was getting written in 2011, 2012. Um, and I was doing stuff there when I was when I was working towards my UEFA B. And I was watching sessions, going into different academies like Bolton and uh, Accrington Stanley, believe it or not, uh, Rochdale and, and various places, Ultram and, and here, there and everywhere, Sheffield Wednesday and, and places. And then uh, started coaching at Rochdale Academy, worked in the foundation phase, worked in YDP, uh, did stuff with the day release programme. One of the last roles I had there was 14s. I was involved with uh, Ryersa, coaching as like, head academy coach, student athletes, also linked with Bradford, um, did 21s. I've, I've been a head coach at non-league level, um, college head coach, head of coaching. So I was head of coach at Bristol Rovers for a short period. Uh, coach education, which I gravitated into. So doing like uh, tutoring for the FAW and US soccer, which was great. Loved US soccer. Um, you know, being in the States for a few years, being as a director of coaching. And alongside that, I was uh, mentoring coaches on the USSF licenses. I still do. And um, to then, you know, fast forward to recent years, you know, working as an elite coach educator with the, with the Moroccan Football Federation. So working in Morocco under Ashan Roberts, you know, getting to work with the National Federation and, you know, being heavily involved in the, shaping the coach education, mentoring coaching nationally, you know, and, and with the national teams and what have you. And, and um, doing that alongside, you know, existing roles where I've founded my own coach education platform and studying my PhD and everything else. So, yeah, sorry, that's a long answer, a bit, bit of everything, really. There's a lot I would like to ask, you know, I'd really like to dive into some of those experiences, I think. You know, other people will be listening to this. I've got to be less selfish. But I, I could ask you so many questions about it because it just sounds so interesting. Uh, even 
the, the two weeks in Italy, I could spend forever asking you questions about that alone. But I'd like yeah. to ask you then, uh, what, what was it or when was it that you decided coaching's for me and I want to take this seriously? I think probably similar to some who would start off, I think if you listen to most people who've probably not played professionally, even though I was at Halifax, which at the time were in the conference and they actually just missed out on going into the Football League. They got to play a final, didn't they? Um, and I was there for a couple of years. But I never obviously played senior professional football, so I didn't have that top playing career, if you like. And it's interesting, I think if you speak to most people like that, or even some of the guys, you know, like a Michael Beale, who obviously was a young pro, he may have had a couple of years, had an injury, what have you, I think. But, you know, certain people haven't had a, an illustrious career, let's say, but they've ended up coaching really early, whether it's at 19, 21, or in my case, you know, 14, 15, 16. And I think there's many coaches like that. You know, you look at Aaron Danks, who started really young doing football in the community sessions and doing stuff with West Brom, then obviously went into the academy and the rest is history of his career. And I think it's pretty similar to that in that I didn't think I was going to have this amazing career as a player. Always was obsessed with learning and coaching and I loved working with players and I always thought, you know, I'll probably end up doing that. And I think the reason why I mentioned those other people as examples is because I think um, I had this belief and I'm sure they probably had something similar. By starting younger, we're able to sort of form your craft at an earlier age, which meant that you can accumulate more years of experience. So if somebody's been playing, and let's say they want to retire at, I don't know, whatever age, you know, 32, 35, 37, they go longer now, but 28, whatever. Or if it's not even, you know, they want to stop, but they, they've been playing, they've got released, they're working their way down the divisions, they're now playing non-league and they're now 28 or 24 and they're going, I want to get into coaching. I've probably already accumulated 10 years before that. You know, so I think that's the advantage. And, and I knew that. I was already sort of thinking into the future and thinking, well, you know, what? I could probably... I really love it for a start. You know, I grew up um, studying people like Simon Clifford. I used, to, I used to spend a lot of time with Simon when I was 14, going down to Garth, getting the bus on my own and, you know, spending time with him, believe it or not, and, you know, playing championship managers and football managers and all them silly, stupid games that you did as kids. I'm sure you did. And, and yeah, and I just thought, you know what, I could probably, I could probably do this. I could probably end up, you know, building a career. And I was fortunate that I did at a young age and, you know, it just grew from there, really, the enthusiasm. It's interesting you mentioned the amount of coaches you've had relatively decent experience, be it in academies or semi-pro, players that were in very, very good playing environments but didn't make it as professionals. And it seems like that was a very, very good coaching education experience for them before they even went anywhere close to doing badges. Do you feel that way about yourself? Maybe. I, I think you're definitely going to learn, aren't you? I think there's an advantage because you can potentially learn in reverse. Like uh, I came through a, a pathway where it was very much aggressive and the coach would stop, stand still, shout at players if you got it wrong. You know, it was error correction. It was scolding, hostile. You know, there was this fear of, making mistakes and what have you. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that being coached that way. No. I didn't like it when the coach would stop it and you've made a mistake and he's just highlighting to everyone that you've made the mistake. So you're even more nervous. And that never sat well with me. And I literally went completely the opposite way. And now, obviously, I'm, I'm definitely more over here. But of course, um, I'd never be hostile, but there's times where I maybe would give, you may have to give direct instruction potentially, but... I would typically be more around setting, giving them problems to solve, even if it takes forever to get it, um, rather than giving them answers, setting them challenges, giving them clues, asking questions. And that's how it started for me. And I probably learned in reverse. And I think, you know, some of us will have done. They'll have seen, you know what, I don't like that. That's not great. I'm, I'm going to do the direct opposite to that. I, I do. It'd be interesting conversation or even a study to do in that there's always this adage, comment that you know just because you're a top level player doesn't mean you're going to be a top level coach and you know history tells us that there's not many um players or like real top level players that have ended up being really successful in coaching 
But I do wonder if that would change, only because the way the players are coached now, you know, more than ever before, we're talking about really like creative thinking, self-learners, they're getting loads of rich experiences, they're getting tournaments, they're getting festivals, they're at a young age, you know, the they're getting loads of different experiences from teaching, reflective practice, you know, having ownership of their own learning plans. Society has changed. The, the way information is stored and shared has changed. A lot more interaction. They're getting exposed to, you know, whereas me and you would would have to probably stay up late to watch Italian football, you know, on the channels and that. And we'd have to, we're from that generation. Um, and there'd be certain restrictions on when you could watch football, when you couldn't, or who you could watch and what have you. And, You'd have the teletext going to see the scores. Or what. They don't have that now. They, they can go on anything. They can get games from the Swedish plumbing third division. You know, they can they can watch football, football, football. They're playing Evo. They're playing FIFA. There's a lot of information being shared. I, I'd wonder now if the if the players today who have a career, and even if they don't, will they be? Will they still? Could they still be actually top level coaches because they potentially come from a a different paradigm. I guess that's another topic for another day, maybe, but right. I probably learned in reverse, you know? There's a lot in that, and you may agree or disagree with my, my kind of anecdotal evidence here, but I feel that the younger players who are making it are far brighter than they ever were. I mean, I've only been coaching for, for 13 years, and at, at good levels, I'm definitely seeing an increase in game understanding compared to what it was when I first started. But on... Yeah. On the other hand, I think general participation levels are lower. And although there is an abundance of resources, I think there's an even lower desire to use them. Is where everything is on demand. Yeah, growing up, I, I watched everything that I could and it was difficult to find. Now it's easy to find, but I'm not seeing the same appetite from kids. And I, I think it's uh, not all kids. The ones that make it, yes, but the... But your general kid, I remember as a child, and a lot of us have talked about this, and I don't want to go back into you know, back in my day, uh, mm -hmm. rose tinted glasses where everything is better. But I think much like how I'm going to get too philosophical, how the Beatles changed music and everything. They were the first to do it. And bands back then were so successful because they were good, but also because there weren't many alternatives. Look at music now. No one dominates the same way the Beatles do. Is that because they're not as good? Or is that because there's so many musical options? We did FIFA. We did uh, the Panini sticker charts. We watched Match of the Day. We watched absolutely everything. Because there wasn't much else to do. So everything we did was football. Kids now have got so many things to do. So many opportunities for them to, to play, to create that. Football has a, a thinner slice of the pie, but the ones that do utilize it, that I, just a few years ago, being able to film games was huge. We never had that as kids. And then suddenly, the kids that started to pay attention to game footage and watch matches, you saw their growth exponentially in a short amount of time relative to the other children because they made use of the technology. While, ironically, the rest of the kids didn't seem that bothered about using that technology. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've waffled a bit there, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I honestly don't know, uh, but I think there's a lot in there. Obviously, the, the advantage now is like technology is fantastic and it gives us, as much as it can be a positive, you're right, there are certainly negatives to it or there can be. Um, and I guess there's a lot of noise as well. So how do players filter through the noise in coaches as well? Um, I don't know, but I think it's interesting when people talk, I know you didn't mention this, but often when people talk about the past or even in general, they go, oh, kids aren't playing on the street anymore and they're doing this and they're doing that like we did in our day. And I, I said this to someone recently at a conference I was at with the LMA and I said, well, actually, there are kids playing on the street. You want to go to Morocco? They're all playing on the street. Yeah. Kids in Morocco, it's not just kids, adults. You'll see guys in the 50s juggling the ball and they're sorting little games out. I remember driving to one area and there's literally kids using bricks and the bricks are the goals and they're playing in the street. It's incredible. In my apartment, there were people playing in the little park. So, you know, it's the same in Holland, same. You'll go to areas in the United States, you'll see kids playing everywhere. So, um, 
it's interesting. I think there's there's good and bad in there, and um, there's a lot of assumptions. And I honestly don't know is the answer. But I think I think the challenge for coaches now is how do you get them to become really obsessed with what it is that they want to do and how do you join obsessions you know so if you think about gamification you know and amy price has done some great work around this in football and russell earnshaw from rugby magic academy and other people but if you if you think about why players play video games why why kids do whatever they do what is it about those things that we like whether it's getting distracted with you know, likes on Instagram and Twitter and all this. And what is it about the, the dopamine and all the rest of it that's getting us going? Um, and gamification, playing games and, and just capturing their attention. I would say to coaches, with the technology we've got, with the resources we've got, find ways to join obsessions. Find out what they love, what motivates them and why they're here. And then really try and join those obsessions in training sessions. So when you're designing practices and you're working on something and you're forming those habits and it's becoming an obsession, join that obsession for the next session, for the next, um, the next practice or whatever, because that's a great way, I think, joining obsessions. And I don't think we talk about it enough, you know, whether it's through challenges, clues, questions, cheats, saving progress, different levels, competition, you know, and this is your, your coaching genius. So if it's using a video and finding ways to, that if that gets their attention, can you give them um, a task where they're analysing Will and they've got to go, right, what, what's William doing over there? Great, how can you give him feedback during the halftime? Can you show him what he... And then the player's giving feedback to the other player, peer-to-peer learning. He's showing you on the video how you could open up your body and where you could go and that, that's the good stuff. And then now you've, you know, in a team of, let's say, seven aside, nine aside, 11, you've got 11 analysts. You know, so every one of those players is an analyst. So tap into that, tap into that enthusiasm. And, and that's what I'd be saying to people. Yeah, we've got all this noise and potential distractions, but find ways to make it an obsession. I suppose that's why coaches use a lot of the, the modern references. Like you see some of the, I'm trying to think the best way to describe it, but they, they use kind of Fortnite or FIFA when they're doing their, their training sessions with the kids. And they'll use the gamification. They'll give power ups. They'll use kind of cards. Yeah. Uh, kids will draw cards, and they got challenges on it. And that kind of stuff seems to be really good at engaging with them. And you mentioned some fantastic coach educators there. So let me ask you, because I think some coaching courses, formal learning tends to get a bad rap. Uh, like you, you know, all the gear, no idea. You hear that kind of expression a lot, and I think that formal coach education from governing bodies is not perfect but I believe it's a lot better than people give it credit for so in your experience what are some of the best formal coaching education uh, experiences that you've had tough because I think um, you're right I think it is getting better it's definitely changed since you know I went through my coaching licenses which was Level one, level two, level three was UA for B, UA for A, level four, and so on. And even now it's changed again. The level two is no longer exists. You know, it's a UA for C uh, with the FA. I think the FAW have gone through similar changes. One minute it was a C license, then it was a C certificate. And obviously now again with the UA for convention, you know, it's UA for C license. Um, Scottish FA have changed. I've done licenses with them. And there's been some good stuff and some interesting stuff. And, that, that you know, they had the youth awards and the children's license, which was great. Not many people were doing that, that specialism. And then they end up changing that into modules. And then that, then the, the level four youth award ended up becoming the C license, basically. So, um, you know, in just in the, a few examples there, and even US soccer, going from historically, from what I've been told, um, where it'd be very much like my way or the highway, which is probably a lot of the FA type stuff years ago, to now, like I would say US soccer is incredible. At least my experience is I've been an instructor, going through instructor training and then delivering on the courses, really holistic, very interactive, very experiential, everything's reality-based, really uh, focused on tapping into the audience and what does the audience know. Um, 
So I, I think there's a definite shift in general anyway. And I've given a few examples there um, as a candidate, as an instructor. I think my answer would be maybe some of the best ones. Again, Russell Earnshaw is great because he always challenges you, Rusty, and gets you thinking. So Magic Academy, um, they would do stuff around really understanding you, putting coaches on the spot, um, setting coaches' challenges on courses um, and getting players to give the coach challenges. So it's a great way for coaches to get feedback, which they might not be aware of and they might need to hear. And the players are brutally honest, so they'll tell you um, if you talk too much or if you do this or whatever. So they might have like these cards, as you referenced, about, you know what, I'm going to give this card to you. Um, and I've seen that be really good or even just small group interactions. Of course, I think, you know, and there's a lot of research in it. Informal learning is great because even stuff like this, it, if there's natural organic conversations, people are chatting in the bar or you, sh you listen to a podcast or wherever it may be, those can have some really rich and meaningful experiences. The danger with formal education is that it's still very much hierarchical in terms of levels. And just because you've got your A doesn't mean you, you're a better coach than somebody who's got the C. And this hierarchical system of you've got to learn this to then be able to do this, to then do this. But learning isn't linear and performance isn't linear. I probably sound like I'm, I'm challenging you a bit there. I don't mean to, just offering a perspective. Um, but I think the, to answer your question, where it has been good and where it can be even better is when it's individually focused. And I think, you know, stuff that I've done on courses or people that I've observed, you know, Pete Sturgis, who's an outstanding quality as a person, very good guy, a huge background in futsal, as you know, and uh, with, the, with the FA, Pete Sturgis, 5 to 11s. Um, you know, there'll be other people I've not met, like Ben Bartlett will be another one who springs to my mind. Um, these sort of people would create an environment where it is literally individually focused. So it's all right that we've got the, the content and we have to get through the content and we've got the slides, but actually who are the people in front of you and how can we tap into them? Because there'll be, there'll be more experience sat down than there is stood up. So it's important to tap into that room. And first of all, like anybody who's presenting should always be asking themselves, you know, what do the audience know and how can I support them? You know, so how do you know what they know? And that's very difficult unless you're doing an awareness wall and, a, and an expectation wall where they can write down their ideas. And the first time I saw something like that was um, Tony Elliott. And he'd done a CPD goalkeeping and uh, it was just really clever, just simple basics on a formal education. But he had an awareness wall and an expectation wall. And I ended up using that and evolving that on other courses that I've done since. And that was years ago. And um, it's literally like, what do you know about this topic that we're going to cover today? Or what do you think we're talking about today? What do you want to get out? Of, like, what, what are your expectations? What do you want to know more about? And it's great because straight away, you can just have a look. And as people are talking and before you've actually kicked off, you can immediately go, wow, I know how to pitch it. I know who's got what experiences in the room. We're definitely going to cover that. We're probably not going to cover that. Maybe I can find a way or maybe we'll park some of that for later. This that looks like it might be of a big need for the group. So this, this group of people might really need to know that. So again, what you're doing in formal education is you're shaping the course and you're designing it around the 20, 24, 30, 10, whatever number it is, people that are in the room, rather than what it used to be, which was those 10 or 20 or 30 people on that course, they've got to fit the course. The course fits them and their needs and their wants. And I think that's where it can be good. And that's that's what's inspired me with you learn, but you know, trying to make things individually focused where a bit like you going to a restaurant or myself, you're you're not getting told there's a menu, but you choose what you want on the menu, right? And even then there might be some flexibility, depending on restaurant, of course, but you might be able to go, actually, I don't want that. Can I if I have less of that, can I have some more chips instead? Or, you know, and you have that negotiation. You choose what you want to eat tonight. And I think that's a huge, great way because it, it comes back to what do they want? And uh, hopefully that answers your question. And yeah, Ben Barlett is 10 out of 10 for that. You know, I remember Ben on the AYA, even on the UA for A, actually, on the UA for A, 
he was doing stuff that was probably very different to what the other instructors did. That, that'd be my opinion. I know other people have that same opinion in a good way, in a very good way. And we saw a couple of different sessions, which you're going to do. And I remember because we were all talking in the, in the stand and everyone was like, I like, I like that way of what he's doing there. I would probably do that in my environment. Probably wouldn't do that. That's like more traditional or how to think. And then Ben was very much like, what goes on in your environment? What are some of your challenges? All right, well, I'll try that. So it wasn't that he was putting on this all singing, all dancing, staged best practice, if you like. Because it might be that some of the coaches who come on these courses have only got a third of a pitch or they've not even got a third. You know, you've got no goals. You've got no... We used to do this in Morocco. We'd be doing sessions at a top, top level, but then at the, at the Hamisic Complex. But if we were doing stuff for the regional guys, we would often show them what does it look like with minimal equipment. So if you only have minimal cones, minimal balls or whatever, and you've only got this area, and that is literally your area, and you're doing that on a dirt pitch and you've got nothing else, what do you do? What can you do? And I went into the regions and saw people deliver D licenses. And I saw people using tape. It was really clever. And they're putting tape on the floor as like markers, if you like, like the cones or the area and just low budget stuff, but they, they made it work. And um, I think that's where it can be really good. So you, you got to have a bit of uh, creative thinking in there as well, haven't you? Mm. And I, I remember when I did the United Soccer Coaches Premier Diploma, they had just yeah. changed the course. So you'd then be assessed with your own team in your own environment because often those final assessments can be a bit false kind of you, you're coaching adults who understand what you're going through who usually try and play the way that you've asked them to unlike in your own environment where you've got so many different things to, <laughs> to manage uh it might not always be real but also it's you it's your level you know every's name and I, I thought that was an interesting approach now i want to talk a little bit more about Morocco and about your uh, time at the Federation because I've got a, a question that really goes into that but let's just finish up on on formal education so you have a PGCE yeah masters and you're currently doing a PhD right yeah I don't you think that's a bit greedy you don't want to leave some certificates for the rest of us <laughs> and it's mad because I was I, I, I would love to from an from a not going off on tangent, but I'd love to go back to that teacher who uh, used to have a go at me at school and I would literally have a laugh in the face because I, I was in the bottom groups for school. I used to get kicked out of lessons. I was I was I had zero interest in going to university. And we had a laugh about this the other day, me and my wife and we were going like, what happened? And I've literally never left education. And it's crazy that the, the turning point for me was when I got, and it comes back to the individual stuff. Um, when I got to study a BTEC in sport, when I was a player with Halifax Sound, and I got to study something that I was interested in, that changed because now all of a sudden I could do what I, rather than having to mess around with Bunsen burners and do whatever stupid, that I'm not going to do when I'm 25. You know, so uh, yeah, it's crazy. I got PGC in lifelong learning, did that with the uh, University of Huddersfield, did my master's at Stirling Uni, which was great, distance learning. So I did that part-time, both actually, whilst um, coaching every day. So I was able to literally reflect live. And I'm doing sessions and then trying to apply the theory. And, and it's, a bit, it's the same now with my uh, PhD. I'm investigating in an area that I want to be an expert in. And I'm able to combine what I do every day with my, my PhD. What is your PhD all about? So it's about, uh, in, a, in simple terms... How coaches can use it. feedback. <laughs> yeah, not for you, more for me. Because um, you know yourself, like, we can often try and use these big fancy words as to sound intelligent. It's ridiculous. Certainly in academia, there's a lot of jargon. And we forget that the whole reason why we're producing this research is so that the guys over here can go and understand it and apply it. Maybe that improves their, their efficiency or their effectiveness. And often... The papers that we're reading and writing, they're not fit for the audience. You know, so Joe Bloggs down the road or whatever high-performing coach, he might not read those journals. And if he does, can he understand it? Um, so for me, it's really important, you know, to be able, as I know you do, to try and say it in English. So it's like, how can coaches use feedback to guide 
the visual search, so where they're looking, scanning, whatever words you want to use, so that players can come up with their own adaptable movement solutions. So that's what I'm looking at. The, 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 the bigger titles is, obviously I'm doing my PhD in ecological dynamics, nonlinear pedagogy, and um, dy with, within a, a dynamical systems theory. So it's a constraints-led approach, use of augmented information, looking specific feedback and instruction. So that verbal augmented information, although you've got haptic and, and visual, but how that's used through transitional information. So often coaches will give feedback. Let's say we're talking about feedback now. Coaches will give feedback either concurrently or terminally. So during action or at the end. They might give feedback during the water breaks. They might give it immediately after he's passed the ball or whatever. So that'd be terminal. Whereas I'm investigating, obviously I'm investigating all that, but I'm actually looking at in particular how transitional information, which is where coaches can give feedback, but they're not telling the player what to do, where to look or how to move. But they're sim And they can do it either concurrently or terminally, but they're simply guiding the player by giving him clues, setting him challenges, which allow the player to then search information from the environment to come up with their own solution. And that's where it, it gets pretty exciting. Um, because we know the game's built up on players searching for information. You know, over 85% of the information players receive is through their eyes. You know, so they're constantly making decisions, they're forming solutions based on time, space, and number variations. So then if we know that, which we know, and we know that every player has their own adaptable and unique movement signature, and what I mean by that is that everyone plays differently, everyone moves differently. So to prescribe a solution or even to model one, like to demonstrate my solution would be different. My body type is different to yours. You know, my, it's, it's, it is straight away flawed, you know, to rely on patterns and formulate these patterns. But we know that the game is chaotic, it's random, it's forever changing, that no situation is the same. So the danger if that coaches go the other way and they just tell players what to do, players become dependent on that feedback. Um, they'll, they can't solve problems in the sense of know where to look for information to grip onto it and use that to, to come up with their own solution. They'll end up seeing a path, not even a pattern, they'll see something that happens that they've not seen before. So where do they look straight away to the coach? Can you solve this for me? You know, and it's just this self uh, fulfilling prophecy it's a negative cycle whereas I'm more interested in how can we tap into the genius of the player and, and allow them to come with their own adaptable movement solution so that they're forever creating their own uh, problems that become more self-regulatory and, and self-learning and that's the PhD really so it's exciting I've had this issue with a lot of coaches before where they're trying to teach almost a, a set model for for technique like a textbook so next time i'm doing that because i've often struggled to articulate <laughs> why i think they're wrong I'll, I'll give you a call if you're not busy and you can help me out <laughs> so, yeah yeah feel free it, it, it can be an issue with with some players who they may have an, an unorthodox looking technique and i've asked this question before to a few people when you look at someone like sadio mani he falls over probably about half the time he actually shoots and so most coaches want to go in there and try and correct that. But then is he successful because he's hard to read? And is he falling over because he's got the agility and the power to reach shots that other players wouldn't? What he's doing isn't textbook. What he's doing isn't necessarily something you'd be trying to teach. It's more he knows the tools of his own body. He's seen the problem in front of him and he's using a solution which might be to dive, slide, jump extend to try and get on that ball and with uh, your standing foot by the side of the ball use your instep knee over the ball head down and, and i think it it takes away a, a lot from the player when, when we're doing that kind of thing uh, it almost it's i don't think we're trying to make robots but it, it can do that a bit at, at times but, no, I yeah, agree. Well, I think there's there's so many good things you said there because it just links back to, you know, every player is different. And to say that there's like this one correct way of doing something is wrong, you know, and and 
Mark O'Sullivan will be able to explain it better than I can, but there was an example of, um, I mean, there's just brought a paper about the magic man and what have you, but a uh, famous player, hockey player, I believe, who held the hockey stick in an unorthodox way. Mm. And as a result of that, more because he just wanted to protect his stick, he came from, from what I believe, he came from uh, poverty and didn't come through like formal training, if you like. And he was seen as one of the best, most creative players in the world. And nobody could really defend against him. Found it very difficult because he wasn't giving them the type of signals that they would normally be looking for to play off. And it, a lot of it was due to how he held the stick. And you see that in some players in other sports, how they'll manipulate the ball or carry the ball. Some players will literally carry the ball with the instep and they're dragging the ball with them and they'll do something different. Just real clever things. I mean, again, like Ozil with his little uh, sort of like stamp chop thing where it bobbles the ball over. Yeah, I need to learn how to play that. That is incredible. Yeah. So it's and to a, even to another extreme where it's Ronaldo and his stance. And some of that's branding and aesthetics. And other as it is, it's his mechanics of how I'm going to strike the ball to create a different uh, type of swerve or whatever. So I think it's really interesting that you, you give him... You're playing with disguise and deception, aren't you? And you're trying to not give players information, which is what it's about, so they can solve the problem. You're trying to trick them. And yeah, so if we know that, try and tap into more the creativity. But some things are by accident. Like this player, he held the stick because he always wanted to uh, protect his stick. He didn't want to break his stick because he wouldn't have been able to afford another one. So he held it differently. You know, some players will do things because of, you know, they might have got through in spite of the system, not because of the system, or they might have got through because of other reasons and, you know, and they've not had uh, formal coaching and luckily we've not uh, killed their creativity type of thing. Yeah, if ability equals potential minus interference, I think some coaches are a bit too much in like, interference when maybe sometimes your job is just to get out of the way, put the coins down. Like, I'm thinking that uh, <laughs> someone like Jimi Hendrix played the guitar upside down how many of his music okay. teachers would have been slapping him saying, not like that. And, and I've got a, a player very similar, and I won't name her in case I embarrass her, but her, her technique is weird, awkward, and she's hard to read. So she will have success when it comes to passing and shooting conversion because the goalkeeper is just half a second too slow because they can't read what she's doing. And yeah. most people would try and almost, and that, no, that looks awkward, not like that, like this, and and... And it, it can sometimes, I think, take that advantage away from people. Completely agree. Yeah. Now, next one, coming on to USSF, and this is probably a very, very big answer that can go in a lot of different directions. And I'd like to ask you, where do you see gaps or, or barriers in, in coaching education? And I'm thinking specifically, I saw a lot of this in the US. And over here as well, uh, as much as we make fun of the, the coaches doing like the, the line drills, one dad laying off balls to 20 kids to take a shot in a goal that's far too big for them on a freezing cold night, that stuff still goes on. And in the US, the, the ed coaching education is fantastic. It's improved so much. I've gone through the USSF pathway and I've gone through the United Soccer Coaches pathway as well. And to see there is amazing coaches in that country, there are amazing coach educators, some of the, the resources they give out are just incredible. And yet it struggles to filter down. And that's not necessarily just your parent volunteer coach. It can be a coach who's quite serious. I went to the convention in 2019 and a lot of colleagues from rival clubs in St. Louis were there. They'd see the same presentations as me and we'd chat afterwards about how brilliant it was. For instance, they all all watched Todd Bean just absolutely slaughter people. I and mean, it was funny when some of the audience walked out because they were so upset with stuff he was saying. These people <laughs> watched those presentations and said, this is great. And they went back to their club and did the same old rubbish they'd always done. And so even people that are spending good money on their coach education still struggle to reach them and get them to understand uh, learning and, and football in general. How, how do we get them to change their habits? What, what, what can we do better? And maybe this is something that you learnably comes into in that you're able to maybe reach more people because it's, I suppose it's more accessible than a formal 
coaching course, which has got a large price attached to it, several days off work, a bit of travel, yeah. an application process. I mean, every few months, Twitter's full of people that got rejected again. What more do I have to do? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's, well, to be honest, there's, there's a lot of things. There's a few things there I'll try and answer. I mean, my, my first thoughts were that it's very easy for people to go back into default because that might be what they know, what they're comfortable with. And um, from my experience and my own belief, and, and this isn't just subjective. Uh, this Some of this, what I'm about to say is objective because one, I've, I've been a coach educator and I've sat on the other side as well. And I've developed coaches at regionally and nationally for a number of federations, pro license right down to grassroots. And we've filmed them and we physically watched the videos back and, and obviously I'm doing this with my PhD. So in my PhD, we're physically using research methods to evaluate the effectiveness of how people work and really understand whether it's through thematic analysis and we're, we're trying to identify certain themes or whether it's through a discourse analysis. And we're really going into the heart of what underpins why you do what you do and the beliefs that you have that you'll, you know, certain coaches will die on the sword for, you know, because that's what they think. So I can share with people that one of the reasons is that often why we go back to default, because we know that that may work or there's some sort of belief that that's the way to do it. There's other political reasons that we may have to do that because if we go off on a tangent and this guy isn't in that or he hasn't been on that presentation or hasn't attended that course or hasn't done whatever, you could lose your job because you're, you're too far away from this guy. And if he's your boss and so there's potential friction there, some people play the game and they'll, when he's present, they'll do it like this. When he's not looking, they'll do what they want to do. Or So there's a bit of that going on. But typically, all parents or other perceptions of what coaching looks like. So if you're not asking, if you're not telling players what to do, does that mean you're not coaching? You know, is coaching telling players what to do? I don't think coaching is filling a glass of, you know, filling it and filling it. I don't think that's coaching for, for me. And I'm sure you should share that, feel the same. Um, but some parents will think that is. Some parents will go, but he's not doing that. Like, he might have gone to this conference or whatever, but no, 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 that's how, um, the previous coach who won games. He didn't do it that way, he did this. So games. Oh. Th there's, yeah, exactly. So there's all those, and there's a lot more, but there's the social, cultural influences and, and constraints. Um, that really shape and influence how coaches work. And a lot of that's financial and other things. To give a real simple answer, why do coaches still do what they do? And I mentioned defaults, is because I do believe that there is this innate belief, and it came from teaching, which is wrong, really, historically, is that coaches feel that you have to, to break down the mechanics of a skill, if I'm using the right words, and you have to break down the game into these little parts, train them in isolation, train players on the correct technique, give them information rips, loads of explicit information of what to do, stop them, show them, model, demonstrate, rehearse, repeat, restart, and then off you go. Go and copy and paste that. And the game doesn't work like that. And what you'll find is that the reason why they like that is for a number of reasons. One, Straight away, they can see it. I can say to you, Will or William, run over there, do this, create width, go there, and as you do this, do it. Okay, great. I'll do that as a player. You'll do that. Don't know why you're doing it, but you'll do it because the coach told you to do it. I can see that he's done it, so therefore they're seeing an immediate short-term performance. So they're, they're, accumulate, they're, they're attaching that to learning, and they can see an immediate return on the investment of feedback and practice design structure so then that reinforces this belief that well this works we've got to keep doing it the other issue with that is that coaches and this is a general statement but I would stick to it is that coaches from my experiences and my research would prefer to do isolated practices or even a progressive model I'm not saying progressive coaching is bad or that's model is bad but just for people listening they will prefer to do that where it's small parts, maybe add more interference or more problems or more pressure, more defenders, reduce the spacing, whatever, but they'll make it more complex, more difficult, more challenging. Um, of course, you can make it less, but typically it'll be start here, 
then build it up, make it a bit more challenging, then build it up to go into a game, right? And the reason why they like that is because in the initial part here, it's slow enough that they can affect it. So if I'm doing a small type of activity and I'm, I can physically, I, I did a session yesterday, um, not my best session, what would be my worst session, um, great to be back on the grass. It was purely, the players were playing within a few minutes. I wasn't talking long. It was literally a couple of bump straight into playing. It was a game-related activity, and they're, they're trying to score. The guy who delivered um, before me, who was on the pitch, and it's not to say my session was better or anything like that. It's not, I'm just using it as a, a comparison, as an example to answer the question. He did a passing activity, but he controlled the progressions. He controlled everything about that dr drill, if you like. He controlled how they received the ball, who played to who. It's very much like when you get the ball, A goes to B, B goes to C, and you receive on it. That was his choice. And coaches like that because they can see it it's slow. And then what they can do is, because their eyes can see it, they can then feel like they can give information and support. If you ask a coach to go, no, let's create a game where there's chaos and it, it looks a bit messy and it's random and things are changing, it's very hard for them to see what's going on because it's a game. So the challenge for coaches is that you've got to be good at seeing things when they're moving, when it's fast, because you're going to have to do that on a match day. And you don't have to see an immediate return. You can put on a session and give them loads of problems to solve and you might not see any necessarily success, if you like, but that doesn't mean that learning isn't taking place. And that's the problem that we've got. That's my first answer to you is that some coaches will be like, well, that doesn't really work for me. Like we had this on the uh, play practice play with US soccer. I love play practice play. I'm a huge advocate. I, I you know, I've used it at, international level, academy level, non-league, grassroots. I've used it everywhere in different ways. And I was doing it even before going on board with US soccer. I was doing variations of it. I just didn't call it play, practice, play, if that makes sense. And there'll be coaches all up and down the country. You're probably doing it. And you're probably doing it and you don't call it that. And I'd be setting arrival activities and games and intentional free play and challenges and guided questions. And I remember one of the coaches on the course was like, yeah, but... I don't get it because the kids are just playing and like they need me to be able to and the, the techniques breaking down the making mistakes and the, I was like yeah that's great that's learning you know it's chaos it's fun but he also didn't like it because it's moving too fast so he felt he can't control it and a huge part of it comes back to control coaches like to control things they like to be able to control it at their speed so they can go and affect it otherwise they might feel inadequate um, I think the gaps in coach education, and it's something that's inspired you learnably, where even the name, it was you learn beautifully. It's this creative journey with the individual. Um, I started you learnably because I didn't want to do what everyone else does, which is, you know, exactly the same session plans, share ideas. Yeah, great. But, you know, this might have worked for Ajax. I mean, it's going to work for you you know, Red Rove, Rovers, under eight girls on a Sunday. You know, so what, what does it look like for you in the trenches and your players and your needs? And trying to get coaches to be really good at coaching what's in front of them, not just what's on my plan and sticking to my plan, but actually being able to adapt and see things and reflect in action as well as, you know, ooh, uh, reflection on action. Cat just jumped on me. Um, and, you know, part of that as a gap for Coach Edward here <laughs> would be... Uh, would be digital innovation. You know, we are literally, we're having a chat now about coaching on Zoom. People's lives are busier now than ever before. You haven't got lots of time. You're constantly busy. We're always on our phones. We're glued to our phones. So if there's a way that, whether it's on the on the, the way to the gym, while you're at the gym, while you're taking the, the push, you're pushing the pram and you're taking the kids to, to school and you drop them off in the morning or wherever it is, if you can access learning that's meaningful for you, that's individualized, and you can choose it, and you can get it as long as you want, as many times as you want, I think that's a huge advantage. Typically, coach education, as it's currently designed, is very much, you come in at nine o'clock, eight o'clock, whatever, you'd be here till 10 o'clock at night, you know, and it's long days, eight o'clock, and my A license was like that. 
it's long days, three days, seven days, 10 days. Even if you do it in blocks, it's still a lot. You're taking time, you're taking money away from people's families. And also how much learning takes place in that, those long hours. You know, it's like going back to university where you sat in a lecture theater for two hours, getting lectured at, and you literally just want to die. You know, so for me, it would be more use digital innovation, find ways to inspire people and make education easily accessible, affordable and attainable in short bits. So they're not having to, you know, attend an eight hour day or a, you know, 24 hour block or whatever, but they can do things in an hour, two hours, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. And this is the beautiful thing with you learn, but you learn is about creating online courses and bespoke mentoring and giving people access to some really cool content across a number of different sports that goes beyond the X's and O's. And that's a huge gap at the minute for coach education in general, in that a lot of coach education still typically focuses on the tactics and what formation of the play and systems of play, animation, principles, all that. And I get that, there's, there's a place for that. But you can have all the knowledge in the world. Sorry if it sounds like I'm going on a rant. Um, but you can have all the knowledge in the world about X's and O's and this, that and the other. And the number nine drops in here and he comes in the house space and he does this and he does that. But if you don't know how to interact with people, you haven't got a great manner, don't know how to create an environment, you know, what, what, what are the reasons, what underpins why you do what you do at practice design level, how you interact with people, how you set chat. Forget all that stuff. Like, it, it's the social element, isn't it? It's how you're connecting with people. Um, and the big thing we say all the time, and I, I use this all the time, is three eyes. So how can you not just inform, but actually inspire and involve? So can you inspire curiosity and challenge people and stretch them? And how can you involve them? So you're almost co-constructing the session plan with them. You're co-designing, as well as um, you know involving them in the process. You know what do you think? How can you make this more challenging? What could we do differently? How can the opposition cause you a problem? Or how can you cut? And you're going on that journey with them. And I think that's where coach education is starting to get to, but it's got a long way to go. And I think the biggest advantage I've got doing you learn, Blee, is that we're not constrained to units and modules of traditional sort of coaching conventions, if you like, like UEFA or whatever. And you have to think this way and you have to coach this way. It's more, here's the beauty stuff that you've got to get right at coaching and things that you're really interested in and go and have a listen. And more importantly, how does that look for you in your environment with your players? How can you adapt this to your environment? And uh, yeah, you know, that, that's, the, that, that's the good stuff. So do you think this is indicative of the future of coach education? I think, it's, I think it'll end up going... Well, potentially has to go away from this sort of idea of like UA for B, UA for A, UA for Pro and all that. It's not to say that you can't have those titles, but again, it's like people running around, I'm UA for A coach. But what does that actually mean? You know, you look at some coaching governing bodies now, national governing bodies, they've actually um, got away with that linear model. And they've ended up saying, like, this is an advanced coaching program, or this is the elite performance program. And it's more about creating these sort of like, but like an accelerator, like you would with a, if you're like a high performing growing company and you're on an accelerator and you're having these meetings and sharing ideas and workshops and doing this and doing that. But it's all individualized to you and what, what's your environment and how can we stretch you more? I think that's where coach education will go. It'll be more like you're on this program. And these are the things that we're going to cover on this journey. And by the end of it, you're going to have these competencies. Um, and if it has to be accredited to a level, I guess you've got to do that at some stage. But I think it's got to be more about that journey. And again, using technology, digital innovation. You know, if, if we've learned anything from COVID, we've got to learn that a lot of things can be done. I know Zoom... Some people don't like it, some people do, but a lot can be done um, digitally without having to drag people here, there and everywhere. In fact, more can be done if we're clever with it. That's not to say that it substitutes the in-person stuff, because it shouldn't. 
and that in-person interaction is equally as important but i think there's a lot of advantages to zoom apps you know um the biggest advantage we're doing with you learn is that we've got the online platform but we're also building and launching our own app so coaches will be able to download the app and again that they'll be able to use that to create community groups share ideas with different people grow their network and i think that's where coach education should go it should be more about like a um, probably the wrong word I'm going to use here, but I'll say it. Bumble for for coaching, in the not like swipe left, swipe right, but more. Who do you want to connect to? Who do you want to? So you know who's in your and like, wow, you know I really want to connect with these guys. Create those learning groups. You can connect with anyone you want in the world. Grow your network because coaching is about network and profile. So if you can grow those networks and those profiles and leverage that. You're going to learn more. And then that learning cell will end up, you know, being really powerful for the people that are in it. If they're all contributing, it's all community and practice stuff. But I think now with the beauty of technology, there's so much more that we can do. I'm excited for the FA stuff because I'm alongside running my own private company. I'm a UEFA coach developer as well for the FA. And they're doing blended learning. So they're going to be mixing in person, in situ, which is what you mentioned before. So rather than assessing them over here, actually look at them with their players in their environment um, as well as virtual and I think again there's advantages to that blended you know so yeah hopefully we see a shift where it becomes more individually focused you know I'm starting to see a lot more coaches from all around the world talk about just completing my online module and so they're able to do stuff in their own time and so you get a lot more individual feedback and I remember falling asleep on on some courses because you play for three hours in the morning, then you'd have a big lunch to replenish your energy, and then you'd just be knackered. And even though the person talking might be interesting, and they might be talking about a very, very interesting, important subject, your mind can't handle all of that, that learning it, and all of that, uh, that level of concentration. I remember some courses would finish at five, I'd be asleep by half past five, because it would be that intense. And it, it's great that people are able to do this in their own time. But let me ask you then, who is you Learnably for and how does it work? So you Learnably is for any coach on any journey, whether you're that coach who's starting out their first ever session, you know, coaching the under eight girls team for the first time, or whether you're a development coach or, or a, a performance coach or an elite high performing coach. You know, we've got coaches on the platform who are working at academy level, development centres, to coaches working at grassroots levels, to coaches working in the Premier League. You know, so we've literally got that wide spectrum. And it's for coaches who are looking to find out more about certain areas, whether that be practice design, the research behind what you do and why, opposition analysis, um, how you use feedback to develop players, self-learning, how you create environments to develop self-learners and problem solvers, and even more, you know, talent perception, confirmation bias, all these things. The topics that would typically, on a traditional coaching course, you, and you've just said it beautifully, you'd end up being there all day, and they'd be right, right, we've got Steve now doing a module on psychology. And he's going to smash in loads of information at you. He's going to be, have that, chuck all that information at you. We're going to cover it all in an hour and see what sticks. Rather than just giving it an hour, we're, we're spreading out these topics over a number of online courses and in small little bits here and there. And coaches can find out more. They can actually get into the detail and it bridges the gap between the academic research and the, what's real world leading best practice. And, uh, you know, that's what's exciting about it. No, I'm certain I didn't get the most out of those courses simply because of how they were structured. I, I know that had it been I don't know, a couple of hours a day over a longer period of time, I would, been, would have been able to extra, extract a lot more from it. So if we go on yeah. to, onto ULMD, what kind of topics do you cover there? What, what can I find as a user? Varies, completely varies from practice design, practice is search, learning is searching. So again, those words will be different to what most users might have heard before. So that's things around seeing the role of the coach as that of a learning designer. 
but how can you tap into the perception and the visual search of the player to even things around, as I mentioned before, like opposition analysis, how you can use video to enhance your coaching, use of feedback, uh, transitional information, constraints-led approach, management, match day prep, match preparation, um, top-level insights from some of the leading experts in the game. So if you want to, even if you're learning ideas from rugby or you're learning ideas from, you know, British slalom canoeing, because we've got the coach who worked, who went to the Olympics. So there's a host of content there for people that really just sparks your curiosity. And that and that's something that I use a lot is how can you stay curious? Um, and, and that's a big part of you learn, Lee. Uh, conscious of your time, and I would love to talk to you all night and I know you've got a cat that wants to spend time with you <laughs> let me finish off with two more if you don't mind yeah let, no it, it's good it's fine it's great oh good. don't say that because I'll go on for another 10-15 questions <laughs> we better cap it or else I'm <laughs> the sun will be coming up soon and I'll still be trying to get as much out of you as I can so in the role of a, a mentor or assessor or a coach educator what do you do to effectively get your, your message across to coaches? Because I've seen some coaches that have failed on the day and they've gone off on one. They've had to be kind of talked down because it's coaching is quite, uh, I, people can get sensitive about it. It's part of who you are. It's hard to separate the coaching from the person. So when we go on courses, coaches are often very, uh, very delicate when it comes to some of the feedback and a little bit nervous and then for someone to come along and say you failed or even not that just that wasn't very good and on top of that it also questions your ability as a coach educator well if if I failed maybe you didn't teach me right or how could you fail me how could you not see that so how do you get some of the points the feedback the, the criticisms across to coaches in a way that it's actually received well I definitely wasn't great at it when I first started. And I probably blame the way in which, you know, looking back, I was able to learn in reverse. Blame how I was, you know, came through that coach education pathway because I'm not a fan of standing there with a clipboard. And I have seen it, saw this literally two days ago. And the guy's like this and he's watching, <laughs> watches all coach and he's got this clipboard and he's running down. To me, that's you. You're putting people. Uh, you potentially putting some people at, um, not at ease. You're making them uncomfortable. You, you you're creating unnecessary anxiety. I think it's subjective as well. It, it can be very subjective, it, and I think there's a danger in how you word your feedback. So, as a coach, mentor, as a coach instructor, you've got to be very careful. And I actually learned this even more with Osh and Roberts and working with Osh. Just how you word things or even say things to people, not just what you put in writing and text. Because again, it can it can shape how they perceive it, it can have a negative connotation depending on how it's read, especially if it's in writing and there's no tone, it can sound worse. You're imposing your belief upon the player. There's this you might get into a disagreement and it, oh, sorry, the coach. For me, I would be more around what am I going to look at today? So, of course, we've got our competencies. But what is it that you want me to really focus on and what have we agreed that we're going to look at? So if it's coach behaviours or if it's practice design, what is it in practice design that we're going to look at today? Okay, method of scoring, because we need to get that right. That was something from previous sessions we've noticed. So how are you going to use certain constraints or how are you going to use certain rules? What, what's the practice going to look like? So really ensure it's a clear method of scoring, but equally... For the, for the players, it's challenging in terms of how they have to score because then that'll influence how they attack and how they defend. So um, it could be that, or it could be their interactions, or it could be the player behaviour. So am I watching the players and how they play? So there's a number of little areas that you can go into, and I would typically go, right, I'm going to laser bullseye that. So I'm going to purely laser focus on that, and I'm going to focus on that specific content that micro detail and then I would have that conversation with that coach before the session 
And I'd say to him, you know, what are your objectives for today? What's your session intentions? And he would say to me, or she, blah, 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 brilliant. What does that look like for you? Show it to me. So again, you're checking for understanding. So there's no ambiguity. There's no, this because even when you give feedback, I might say something. And I learned this having worked in Morocco because you're doing everything in French. So it's French or Arabic. There's no English. So uh, for me anyway. So obviously it's even harder. You've got to make sure that how you're communicating, it's really crystal clear. Um, and again, the Premier League would use this approach of you, me, we, which would be start with the other person, what do they think, get their feedback, their understanding. Then it'd be my perspective and then together we agree. So you, me, we. And I've used that approach as well. Um, typically, I would be more, what's your session intentions? You know, if you're working on changing uh, point of attack, switching play, whatever, breaking lines, whatever, what does it look like? What are some of the pictures that you're trying to see or, or problems that you're hoping the players will solve? Okay, great. So now I've, I know I'm, I've got things in my own mind what I think it could look like, but at least we're shared in our understanding of if we're using the word counter-pressing, what does that mean? Have we got the same definition type of thing? Um, and then I would be doing things like, it's not to say that I haven't made notes because I have, I've definitely had my pad and made notes, but I would be earpiece, phone, talking to an iPad, voiceover. So it's all automatically typing my notes. I'm saving time as well. I'm not having to do things two or three times. Um, I'd be taking pictures of the session or video. Even if it's video in any way, I'd be filming it myself because I can timestamp that. And I can also think about my comment in relation to that. So if there's something I've seen and we can have a discussion about that. And then I'd be asking the coach on the side, I'd be almost with them on that journey and be going, what do you notice about this? Or I've noticed, how can we change this? Or what, if this has happened here, what could be the problem for you? How does that relate to the principal you're trying to, brilliant. Ah, so you're going to do great stuff. Now nah, I love it. Well done. And it'd be that, it'd be that conversation. And then you're already ironing out stuff rather than me going, mm. and then at the end you kill them. Because for the coach, he could be thinking, you could have just told me that. Why don't you come over and pull me? or say, hey, I've noticed that it's not quite clear. Or actually, the players have sussed this out and they're cheating. So now it's not challenging. So what could you do? Which is great. The players have done that. Players are cheats. So they're going, actually, you've said to score the goal, you've got to go in here or here. And we're just going to defend like this. But it's going away from the reality of the game, the realism of the game. We don't want them to do that on a Sunday or a Saturday or whatever. But now they're just playing the game, not the game or their game. So what could you do to change that? And how can you make it more challenging? For, oh, well, maybe I could do it. Oh, why don't we ask the players? Let's try it. So say, to them, what could you do? Oh, well, we could put this brilliant off we go. And now what that coach has done is he's learned more than ever because he's reflecting live. It's a lot calmer. It's not threatening. And you're giving them feedback without them really knowing that they're getting feedback because you, you're doing it together. And then when you're having those discussions at the end, I'll be asking them, like, what? Do you, of course, you always say, like, you know, what do you think went well? What could be even better? You seen the kind of background. But I would also be quite keen to go, go and have a think about it. Go and have a look. At, go and have a look and um, watch the video back yourself and then come with me with some of your questions and thoughts. Because I think there's a danger that we often like hot brief straight away. But actually, like me the other day when I did the session, I knew what was not great that I could have done better. I knew there's areas I was like, if I'd have had five minutes, or if I'd have managed my time better, or if I'd have done this, I would have changed this challenge. I'd have just said to the players, right, I'm going to give you, you can try and score by playing around the block, but for every pass that you do that eliminates the defender and plays through, if it leads to a goal, it's worth more. Try and find ways that you can find the number nine. Number nine, I want you to... I might have done something different, but that reflection, some of that didn't come until the drive home. So I probably needed that time just to decompress and have a bit, you know what I mean? Like a bit of me time and you're going through things. I think there's a danger that we, we often jump on people and be like, right, what did you think? Yeah, you know. So I, I would be... I'd try to avoid too much, um, you know, anxiety or whatever, 
it should be like, you know what, we've done a great session today. Some, there'll be some unbelievable positives. Even if it was a car crash, it won't be a car crash. There'll be something in there. There'll be more than one thing in there that'll be like, that was actually really good. And can we build on that? And let's build on that and find ways to do that even better. Um, and that's how I would do it. And I think that's the, the best way rather than imposing, you know, a right way or a wrong way to do something. And then I would always say to people, being honest, sorry, my answers are too long. Um, but uh, I would always say to people like, you know, this is my preference, but doesn't mean that it's the only way. And that's my way of saying to them, look, I might prefer this, but I don't want you to think that like you have to do it that way because I've said it or equally like, my way is the best way because it might not be. It works for me, it might not work for you. But I would offer them that and I would say, like, I can see what you're trying to do there. I probably, you know, my preference would be more this, but it's fine. Like as long as you've got a rationale behind what you've done, why you've done what you've done, fantastic. Mm. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. You're right. The video doesn't lie. Yeah. And sometimes feedback immediately afterwards, it can be a bit hostile and you've not had proper time to reflect and emotions are high and people aren't always that receptive to it. And just from, from this weekend gone, we lost our game and players in the moment didn't think they played well. But a few days later, they've watched the video. And gone, Actually, yeah, that was all right. We were just unlucky. And of course, as a coach trying to say in the moment, like, well, we made enough chances. We did really well at this, this and this. It, overall, it's a positive performance. No, shut up. You're just saying that because we lost. So you want to cheer us up. And then when the emotion's gone, now, perhaps it's actually uh, well, kind of a, a priming technique and a defence mechanism all rolled into one. <laughs> but still, video doesn't lie, does it? And it's no. really good to be able to use that kind of technology. Uh, and it does sound a lot like how you would give information and feedback to a player as well. So a lot of empathy, a lot of connection, a lot of we're on the same side. And, and perhaps some coaching courses, the environments are too... Uh, they're over and done with too quickly and there's a lot of candidates it's hard for assessors to always build that relationship and get to know everybody and so just like with a with a group of players it's sometimes hard to get a relationship with everybody within the first week and if a week is all you've got on a course then you're not always going to be on the same page are you no exactly exactly i think yeah i couldn't say any any more you've said it perfectly yeah and then just be creative as well. There's so many things that you can use now, whether it's your iPhone, whether it's your iPad, whether it's a GoPro, mm -hmm. or even other stuff you can do, you know, that you can catch video. So there's no reason really why you can't watch stuff back or film yourself or or ask a parent. Ask mm -hmm. a parent and say, oh, could you, could you do us a favour? I just want to catch, even if you can only catch a little bit, yeah, just put that in the mind. Why not? And then you've got something there and it's a great way to watch it back, you know, and reflect on yourself and ask others what they think. Um, a good one for coaches would be, how would players describe you? So if I was to ask one of your players, you know, what are you like? What would they say? Um, and that's an interesting one because obviously we might have our belief of what we think they would say or what we want them to say, but is that what they would say? Um, how would players describe a session by, you know, Will Wilson or Gerard Jones or, you know, Cameron Edwards or whoever, you know, Joe Bloggs? How would they do that? So, um, so yeah, I think that's interesting. Get feedback from others. So let's finish off by talking a little bit about Morocco. Uh, I know you've been to lots of places, but this is one that really fascinates me. And people that are, that know me and that listen to this a lot, they know I'm really, really interested in the less than conventional or, or kind of off the beaten path football uh, locations. So most coaches have been to the US at some point and their culture is fairly similar to ours. It doesn't feel like that big of a step outside the comfort zone. We're in Morocco, different country, different language, different culture. Uh, what do you do to adapt when, when you go places like that? And how did you adapt to Morocco? Well, do you know what? I had to adapt very quickly. And I think without blowing my trumpet, I probably adapted probably quicker than most I think um, I may have even had further to recover from you know in the initial period when I first arrived 
and I managed to recover from it and, and end up being outstanding, you know. So I think a lot of that was probably because the culture is so, so, so different. And what what people think works in England and Google spreadsheets and, you know, getting it on the Google calendar and Zooms and all that. I mean, of course we did Zooms and we did stuff and, you know, the, the technology over there is quite good actually at times, but some stuff just don't work, you know. So I'd often speak to people in back home and they'd be like, what do you mean I don't understand? No, 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 you have a meeting and there's an agenda and you do this and you do that. And, uh, you know, and you have a follow-up and, no, 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 you like in a, in a cult, you do this and this. And I, listen, that will not work in Morocco. I'm telling you now, or in certain areas it can, in certain areas it can't. The challenge I had, and I'm going to sound like I'm going to contradict that previous statement, because there would be some stuff when I first arrived that was, well, why can't this work in Morocco? I'm not having that. Like, I don't get this. And we've been brought over because we think differently. And because we're getting paid a lot of money to bring ideas. So why would we just copy and paste what the Moroccans have always done? Otherwise, I might as well just hire Moroccan. We might, we, we're coming over with some experiences that share that. And I think my challenge, and I would say it was a challenge for others as well, I know for a fact they would agree with me, is that often you, you're potentially wrestling with yourself, where you're like, that can't work. That can't work because I've been told it can't work, but actually I don't agree with that. I think it can. And I went through a transformation where it was almost like identify what are the wins, what are the quick wins, what are the things that, that don't lose your authenticity and who you are. You've got to be comfortable in your own skin. But equally, you might have to rein some stuff in and, and amplify other stuff. But things when it came to like flip chart papers and small group tasks and setting coaches challenges and being interactive and showing a little bit of vulnerability and things like that. I was told that those things be very careful. They won't work in Morocco, but it did. It did work in Morocco. And actually the coaches loved it. And even now with, with the way that they do coach education and people are still keeping in touch with in the regions, they're doing more of that. So um, they've gone away from this traditional but hierarchical sort of way. But again, it's culture over there. It's Arabic culture. You've got a couple of factors. You've got football, you've got Africa, and you've got Arabic culture. So all that in the mix, you've got an interesting spice. And over there, it's very much like if I'm in this position, you're in this job, you know, like I'm above you, I'm better than you. I'm a, it's very hierarchical. It's just the, and, you, and there are certain things that you, you learn very quickly that you're almost fighting with hundreds and hundreds of years of culture you're not going to change that overnight it is impossible and there's a lot of things that they do that is very much french and there's no surprise because obviously they were they were ran by the french right and that was how they've done stuff so it's embedded in the way that they operate and the way that they think so for me it was i give you all those examples where i'm like i'm wrestling with my own sense i'm contradicting myself I end up going back to what I thought was always right and then I end up being really good at it. But this stuff, I definitely did change and I didn't do that as I would have done before. And I calmed down a bit and I went a lot slower. Because over there, it's very much tranquil, beswear, beswear, sway, sway, you know. So you have to change. You have to be a bit of a chameleon. Don't lose yourself. But you also have to very quickly adapt and go, what what's going to work here and, and get and bring people with me as much as them bring me with them and what isn't and if it's not is it something I want to fight for yes or no and you have to make that call you have to go am I going to win this battle yes or no is it something I want to die my sword for is it going to make a difference if it's not going to make the world go quicker you know if it's not going to change lives why are we losing sleep over it move on you know and you, I, that's how I did it but every day you would see things that were different you know uh, meetings would be different you, it was difficult to plan in advance and I used to plan really in advance and when I had control of things they typically did go well but there'd be certain things where you'd be like no we're not doing that now <laughs> you know why and then you'd have to like quickly adapt and you'd have to do it on zoom or you'd have to move a facility or one minute it's this date, now it's this day, and then it's back to that day. 
no, now it's tomorrow. Oh, you know, the president's coming in or the FIFA president's just showed up and we didn't know. And so there's all that going on. And it's a bit like putting your head in a tumble dryer <laughs> every day. It's like you just do not know what's going to happen from hour to hour. But what an incredible experience, you know, and, um, and even without going off on one, because we could talk about it in detail, but I remember um, I recently had to present a, a conference in Portugal as part of my PhD research. One of, the, one of the first things that stood out to me, among many, but one of the first things that stood out to me was how fast the, co the, the people spoke. And I was like, flipping heck. You're giving these guys no chance to understand what you're saying. So some of them might not have a great grasp of English. And the ones that do, especially if you've got a tough act, you're killing them and you're using really complex words. And one thing I definitely got better at in Morocco was how slow you can talk. But just talking like almost like you're talking to a child, it'd be very simple French, but you're getting the message across very clearly. And even if you did stuff in English, you just, again, it's the tone and the speed and, and um, yeah, and just the way of life. And, you know, you can definitely come back better for it. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll answer some of your questions, but incredible, completely incredible. And I, I don't think you can really adapt for it until you're there. When I got there, it was like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> you've got to quickly adapt, um, which is great. With, with the site to prepare people that are asking me for information on different places. I'm, I'm trying to do what I can to prepare them for wherever they go, but no amount of, of videos or, or insight or, or Q and A can, can really prepare them for it. You can, you can paint a really, really good picture, but nothing is quite like living it. Now you, you mentioned sure. uh, vulnerability that you weren't, you believe that you weren't able to show vulnerability. Is that, due to some kind of stereotype, some archetype about uh, you coaches in control, coaches in power, you can't show weakness, you can't show humility, because that, that's kind yeah. of odd at times with the self-deprecating nature of British people. Uh, and I'll, I'll readily say things like, oh, I don't know, or, or what do you think? Or like, play stupid to solicit an answer from someone else. Yeah. Does that not work there? I think it's how you do it. I think it's how you do it because I remember, um, I've got to be careful what I say after this on this one, but <laughs> I remember there was one instance on one of the courses and um, I, I would have normally probably been like, you know, been like that, showed myself open and gone, well, actually, this could have been a lot better. How would you have done it differently? Well, and I was very quickly told when I was chatting to whoever it was I was chatting to about revealing who it was, it was like, F that. <laughs> Don't do that. Because they'll kill you. Mm. Like, what? He's like, no, they'll kill you. They'll kill you. He says you can't you cannot show that weak that that um that weakness or that it, it'll hurt you. Um and I think that's why I go back to like it's how you would do it. So because I, I, I've got no issues with showing vulnerability or being humble. And I think some people probably, you know, they might find it endearing or whatever, they might like it might warm to you more if anything but I think again it comes back to how you do it because equally and it might be part of the culture over there and it might just be in general there's there's almost this everyone's looking for like the weakness and some things can be seen as a huge weakness they'll be exploited and very quickly that could end up in the media or whatever so you've got to be very 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 careful um, and you're fighting with that it was strange like you're often the instructors can't be... I remember one of the guys, he didn't like um, the instructors being questioned. He, he thought that was wrong. And that was different for me, different for people I worked with, um, you know, because we've come from this sort of like British whatever mentality and we would literally be like, ask us questions like, why did you do what? Not a problem. And we, well, my thoughts are this or... We wouldn't see that as an issue, but they did. Or maybe it was the way in which the question was asked. I don't know. You know, because if they're doing it in Arabic, I don't know. We had to have things translated, you know. But, um, yeah, so that was an interesting one because he would see that as no. 
no, the instructor is here and they are there. Whereas everything we've just spoke about before, it very much like we're together, we're going on this journey together and there's no ego, right? But I, there's a lot, and there's a lot of ego in football anyway, isn't there? And I, I know some of that is okay, but there's a lot, for me, I would be more, um, go on a journey with somebody and, and try and figure out what works for them. But it doesn't have to be personal. You know, me and you could do a session today. There'll be things that will be good. There'll be things that weren't so good. Doesn't mean that we're a bad coach. Doesn't mean that we we suddenly turn bad or whatever. I mean, this is the challenge. And like, I find this, you know, I'm open, I'm open to say, it. I think sometimes we go through these real big struggles, don't we? And we can lack confidence. And it's all about confidence. And people forget that in order to be competent, you must first be confident. But it's very hard because as a coach, you can go through these moments and you can have a horrid of a session or somebody, like you said, someone's failed you. And they said, no, you're not, not good enough for your whatever, your A for B or whatever. I can tell you, I, I won't name the names because they might not appreciate it, but I can tell you now that coaches I know, and you know them, who are coaching in the Premier League, some of them are coaching in the conference right now, who failed their UA for B, failed their UA for A, end up doing their UA for A in another federation, and they work at some of the top levels and they're highly respected. One coach who's well known, who works with a famous player that ended up signing for Tottenham and has uh, moved on since, I might be giving it away. He failed his A licence. Um, so it just goes to show that, you know, it doesn't mean anything, does it? And that, that could be like, a, and I think that's where, probably going back a few steps to what we spoke about before, it might be another reason why the FA has had that shift and a lot of the federations towards this competency framework. I don't know, because I was the last one who came through the pass or fail. And I remember finding out in the car park, did I pass or did I fail? Luckily, it was great. I passed. I was like, thank God for that. First time, brilliant. Let's crack up. You know, we'll celebrate. But doesn't mean it was a great session. Doesn't mean it's just, could be luck of the draw, couldn't it? And it's interesting how we've gone from that shift now to we're not treating it episodic. And like, we're just looking at one-off events. We're going to see it as an, a series of events. And where are you? And, and one way or another, you'll get to the end journey. It's fine. Or you'll keep going. And um, I know US soccer do that. US soccer aren't looking at it as you're a B licensed coach now and you'll pass your B or your A. Some people might not be quite where they need to be, but they're like, you know what? The growth that they've took from the course and where we're projecting them to go, we're going to give them the A because we can see them going on that journey and they might get there later than somebody else who's already at the bus stop here and he's going on to that next stop. We're picking up this coach at this bus stop, but he will get there. And I quite like that, like that, that um, seen potential where others don't, in that they will get there. Um, I think it's a better way of doing it. You just give me flashbacks to all those courses when you'd find out on the day and you then have to walk past all your oh. peers and it'd be, right, who's got the furthest to go when they finish? And you, you work out your, your, your order. And True. it would be one coach who wasn't very good. And if they passed, you, oh, all right, <laughs> we will pass today. The, and there was one in particular. I can't remember what course it was. This guy came out and we we'll, how'd you do? And, yeah, I passed, lads. Oh, wow, well done. Off he goes back to his car. So we're all thinking, brilliant, we've all got this. Later found out he actually failed. And he was lying to us to save face. And, and uh, that's what this, this can do to people at times because it is so competitive it really does affect your your ego and a lot of your, your standing as well i mean we're, we're all so proud of, of what we do it goes straight in our twitter bio and on, our, on our linkedin and then to find out you've paid hundreds of pounds for something taking time off work and some bloke in a tracksuit who you met last week says you're not good enough it it does have an effect and it makes people do some some crazy things that so i have seen since in the last few years, evolution on the coaching courses, the support is a lot better for those who are not quite there yet. And it's, yeah, I hope that more people now benefit from that going forward because I, I do think it is, you can see the continuous learning after a, a course is finished, even for those who pass, 
how they would continue. So that's it's good to see that change. Well, for me, I, I just think it's as simple as, you know, you're saying to somebody that they've, they've met a level of competency, but more importantly, they'll have, ta- they'll have taken some great learning experiences, having been on those conversations or been on the course. And this is one of the things I like about you, Learn, Blake. They'll, hopefully, they'll, they'll take something. For sure, they'll take something from a course or whatever. And then how they get there, that's up to them. You know, you could do your UA for C or UA for B or whatever, but they'll get there eventually. And I think that's the beauty of it. And it's it's more recognising the quality of the questions that they've been asking. Because the quality of your questions is the quality of your values, isn't it? So the quality of the stuff that they've been experienced to, that'll then, that's richer than anything. And uh, I see value in that. So, yeah, I think it'll be good. Better than, uh, like you said, having to do that long walk down the stairs or in the car park in the corridor and everyone's going, ooh, yeah, cruel criminal, crimes to football. All those looks that we be giving each other, all the, the nerves. So I'd like to thank you for your time. I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. Simple answer. You can only coach in one country for the rest of your coaching career. Where do you go and why? America. Um, <laughs> that wonderful cuisine over there fantastic experience you know in terms of lifestyle but I mean I, I say lifestyle but I never live a lifestyle I'm always working but I think just what a beautiful country you'll earn more money and you'll do really well any particular state I'm not too fussed most people would probably like to go probably because I'm so invisible you know in my my amazing see-through skin over there but I, I, I generally I'm not that bothered I mean I could go to California I could go I, I've obviously worked in New York and Michigan which are typically known for being quite seasonal and quite cold for me it would be more for anyone listening as well don't just think oh, I want to go somewhere because it's, sh- it's sunny and shiny and great and whatever look at it from a real strategic perspective of who are the people that you're going to be surrounded by um, you know is it Texas is it Michigan? You know, Michigan's great because it's cheap to live. It was when I was there, you know. So again, you've you've got that perspective. Um, New York, I knew was going to be good because I saw it as a bit of a blank canvas. But I also saw that there was people like Tim Bradbury and other people who I could connect with, who I'm still in touch with today, that would help me fulfil my ambition of being an instructor and going on that pathway with US soccer. You know, otherwise I could have ended up in California or... Texas or wherever so it depends what you want to go for you know and where you want to focus but um, see it as a project but yeah I would say America Wonderful well thank you very very much for your time thank you for coming on talking to us and going through your experiences I've really really enjoyed this and I can't thank you enough for all this wonderful information and best of luck with you learn but it looks brilliant and I can't wait to see it benefit many coaches out there no, thank you so much. Thanks for the chance to just just chat, just interactive, share ideas. I'm excited to hear it on the podcast and come out where people can hear it more. And yeah, just excited and uh, going on this journey. And obviously people can find out more information about me and on Twitter and, you know, we're all in the same game. So it'd be good to share more ideas. Another great guest has so much to learn from. Making a habit of going over the hour with these great coaches, but that's only because of how interesting they are to talk to you and learn from. Make sure to check out You Learn Bay. It's a great coaching education site, not just for football coaches. BSCM members receive generous 50% off annual memberships with You Learn Bay, allowing members to access all the great content, such as topics on coaching abroad, practice design, and scanning. We'll see you next time.